Hello and welcome to the second part of this series uh, for analytical biochemistry about mass spectrometry. Uh, in this episode, we're going to talk specifically about matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, or MALDI, and time-of-flight detectors, because they are the most common things that are put together. So firstly, before we start, I'm going to talk about uh, sample ionization. So mass spectrometers are under complete vacuum inside them so that we don't measure the molecules that we don't want to measure. So anything that is inside the mass spectrometer gets sucked out by the vacuum system. In that case, the only things that can move through the mass spectrometer are charged molecules. So to be able to measure the mass of a compound, we need it to be in the gas phase and we need it to be charged. Now, there are loads of ways of actually getting molecules into the gas phase um, inside a mass spectrometer. Electron ionization, chemical, faster atom bombardment, inductive coupled plasma, and secondary ion mass spectrometry. We're not actually going to talk about any of those because this is about analytical biochemistry. And so therefore we will, we will limit our discussion to MALDI and electrospray. So the first thing we're going to talk about is this matrix assisted laser desorption and ionization and this has been around since the mid 80s it was uh, first invented uh, reported by france hillenkamp and michael Carras, and they found that if you co-crystallize amino acids such as aniline with a uv absorbing matrix in the case of them tryptophan and if you irradiated the sample um, with a laser at 266 nanometers, the tryptophan, in this case, the matrix is indicated in blue, um, would absorb that energy and it would transfer it to the analyte and cause it to be desorbed off this plate as charged molecules into the analyzer. Now, um, this was refined by a Japanese gentleman called Tanaka in 1987, who used it to show that you could ionize a 35 kilodalton protein uh, into the gas phase and measure its mass. And for this, it won in the Nobel Prize in 2002. Over time, um, MALDI matrices were refined, but they have in common that they have a UV absorbing acidic nature. And so this particular molecule at the top here, this is alpha cyanohydroxycinnaminic acid or CHCA. And this is another molecule called cinnapinic acid. And so what you can do is you can mix these matrix with your biomolecules, whether they be proteins or peptides or lipids, um, and you spot them onto a target plate and you let them dry out so that they end up looking like these dried crystal matrices. And then you put them into the vacuum chamber of the mass spectrometer and you fire the laser at them so that the ions are desorbed into the analyzer. Typically, MALDI has been coupled with time of flight. It doesn't have to just be uh, coupled to time of flight. It can be used with Orbitrap analyzers as well, but the majority of work has been done with time of flight. It, time of flight is also used in another instrument we're going to talk about in the next part of the series. Time of flight's relatively simple. It is just measuring the time that it takes for an iron to go from the source to the detector. And the length of time that it takes to go from this point to the detector is directly related to its mass. Um, because what happens is that under the same electrical force, different size molecules will drift at different rates related to their mass through the flight tube. Theoretically, the mass range of these is unlimited, but it is is unlimited, but it can be limited by iron velocity. Um, your sensitivity is somewhat determined by how hard the molecule hits the detector. 
and larger molecules have lower velocity, so they don't tend to hit the detector as hard. So the flight time can be calculated by this equation, and you can use that to calculate the mass. And so what we can do is um, we can use this to uh, measure the mass of our molecules. Now, one of the problems that you may notice here is that let's say that these yellow molecules are all of the same molecule and they are all of the same mass, but because they are at different moments in space, they are going to hit the detector at different times. So if you didn't, if you had these spread out, what you would end up with is a situation like this, where this on the bottom mass is related to time in this case. And so because the molecules hit the detector over time, the mass resolution is not as high. What we can do is we can do a thing called delayed extraction, which we can take these ions that have different flight times and we can allow the slower ones to catch up to the faster ones so that when they leave the source of the mass spectrometer, they are all have the, st the same start time and the same velocity. So what that means is we can improve our resolution from this to this, where now we can start to see the isotopic resolution between uh, charge states of, in this case, a peptide. The way that we measure things in time of flight is we measure the time that they take to hit this detector at the end of the flight tube. And so what we do is we measure the number of molecules that are hitting the detector at a certain point in time, and we use what's called bins. So what we do is we measure, in this case for half a nanosecond, how many ions hit the detector. And as the molecules of the same mass arrive at the detector, the number of ions in each bin gets larger and larger and larger until you get the maximum number of ions and then they drop off um, because the ions are spread out slightly in time. They should all arrive at the same point in time with the detector, but they don't. Um, if you then draw a line across this, the center of this peak is then the mass of the particular molecule that you're measuring. As I said, if you can get the um, all of the molecules of the same mass to occupy the least amount of space, you can create more and higher resolution. What it also does is, if you've got this number of ions spread over this particular amount of time, and you compress them into this amount of space, your sensitivity goes up because the number of molecules that are hitting the detector at the same time is increased. So you're increasing your level of sensitivity. So we can look at this um, in linear TOF, which is just, we start from the source and it's just a straight flight path to the detector. We can detect quite large molecules. What MALDI does is it tends to create low charge state molecules. So you typically see one plus ions, sometimes you see two plus ions. So this is the spectrum of myoglobin, and this peak is 1,600 and, uh, sorry, 16,951 Daltons, which is the intact mass of the peptide plus a hydrogen ion. So you can see that here. This little blip down here is probably um, an adduct of some kind, um, whether it be sodium, potassium, or something such as that, or it could be a post-translational modification. We do have a population where we have two hydrogen ions being taken up, and this mass will be half the mass of this for reasons that we discussed in the last lecture. Carbonic anhydrase is a little bit larger, and so you get the one plus charge state, a two plus charge state, and a more intense three plus charge state. As I said before, smaller ions tend to have a higher velocity so they can hit the detector at um, uh, harder and therefore create more signal. Um, one of the, and what 
of the things that you would have noticed on the last slide is that those peaks are quite wide. We didn't have any isotopic resolution. We're actually measuring the average mass of, the, of those proteins, um, the average of all of the molecules, whether they've got C12, C13, two C13s. So we get quite a wide peak that is not as accurate as we would like it to be. One of the ways that we can increase the mass resolution is actually by using reflector time of flight, where we have a region here at the end of the flight tube where we reflect the ions back to another detector. And this is what these things actually look like within the machine, these rings of stacked electrodes, which are able to reflect charge molecules back. The effect of this is um, that firstly, it makes the flight path longer and therefore you get more resolution between ions of a similar mass. But what it also does is it compresses the iron packet um, of the same mass into a smaller piece of space, which increases the resolution. So what this looks like, these are the same mixture of peptides. In linear mode, you get these wide peaks where you cannot see the isotopes. And in reflector mode, you can see this is the population of C12, 1C13, 2C13, 3C13s. So you can see the increase of information that you get from using reflector time of flight. Reflectors tend to be used on small molecules, um, less than say five kilodaltons or 5,000 daltons. You can use it for larger and larger molecules, but you need to tune the reflector for those larger molecules. Um, an example of this instrument is one that we used to have. Uh, the instrument is still on the campus. Unfortunately, uh, it's not operational anymore, where you had your iron source down here and you fired the irons through the source, through a collision cell that you could or could not use to the reflector and back down to this detector. It was about a three meter flight path. Because this looked like an unfolding transformer, um, one of the academics nicknamed it Megatron, um, and unfortunately Megatron is uh, no longer functional. Mauli is not hugely used in proteomics or uh, lipidomics, metabolomics anymore to look at complex mixtures. But what it has found a very, very high use for is in this idea of Mauli imaging, where you can start to look at the spatial distributions of molecules. So what you can, what it does is, is because you can fire the laser at a specific point and ionize the molecules that are at that specific point, you can use this to basically fire the laser at one point on a piece of tissue and get a mass spectrum of everything at that point. And then you move to the next point and you repeat the process. So you tend to do this anywhere from 10 to 100 micron spacing. And you move your way across the tissue in a line and then you come back and you work your way across the tissue continuously until you build up um, a, a database of the spectrum at a particular point has these particular molecules in it. What you can then do is visualize those where you can say, right, show me the um, where the this particular mass appears in this tissue section. So you can see highlighted in red here, and the more red, the more intense that iron is, the more abundant that iron is. Um, you can see the red areas is this iron here, the green is this iron here, the blue is this iron here. And as I said, the more intense the color, the more the amount of the particular molecule that is there. So you, it's essentially doing untargeted microscopy where you can raster across and then you can look at the images to go, okay, I know the mass of this particular peptide, where is it? Or I know the mass of this particular drug, where is it? And get these images that show you the spatial distribution of those molecules. The other main use of MALDI is in what's called biotypers. 
and these are used to identify microorganisms by doing spectral matching, where you have a database of organisms that have been purified and then um, subjected to Maldi mass spectrometry to build a fingerprint in the database. What the pathologist can then do is they can isolate a colony from a plate or from uh, a sample. They can spot it onto the Maldi target and put it inside the instrument and do time of flight on it and look at what, and the molecules and the peaks that come up represent certain molecules and those molecules are unique to that organism. And therefore, you can match the peaks from the sample to the reference database to identify what the microorganism is. So rather than waiting you know, a number of hours or a number of days to do certain types of microbiological tests, you can do it in a few seconds. And this has revolutionized um, patho a, um, pathology and microbiology labs to quickly find out what kind of microorganisms are in a particular sample. So that's um, our brief wander through Maldi mass spectrometry. So we've shown that Maldi is a way of turning molecules into ions so that their mass can be measured, typically by time of flight. And nowadays, those Maldi-based instruments are mainly used to do imaging and also to do strain biotyping. You can use them for other purposes, like looking at purified molecules or complex mixtures and things like that. But there are better ways of doing that, especially using electrospray and liquid chromatography. The next part of this series, we're going to talk about electrospray. We're going to talk about quadrupole analyzers, orbi traps, ion cyclotrons, and ways of detecting ions that come out of those analyzers.